And what I would like to address today is that how is it possible that um, we know that consciousness dwells in this body? We all are consciousness. Most of us who have been on the path, who have been reading the books, listening some teachers speaking, reading some scriptures, or even having direct experience, know that spirit dwells in the body as the body and this basically constitutes as the ultimate truth however why do we not experience that at all times why do we not have that direct what can see what can conceal spirit how is it possible that this magnitude of you know of infinite beyond any conception, beyond any conceivable uh, means of understanding, something which is omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient, how can that be obscured or overshadowed by something which is temporal, something which by its very nature not permanent? And as the scientists tell us today or suggest us today, you know, the scientists from the field of quantum physics, that the matter itself is not something that is kind of, you know, it's not something which is solid and permanent. It's rather a fluctuating degrees of energy in the way they are compacted, and, you know, all, all subject to the degree with which that energy vibrates with which that energy basically in all these particles and how all this matter is being composed and you know ultimately speaking it's an empty space there is you know there's nothing that we can put our finger on how can that which not real so to speak in that sense can obscure or obstruct or overshadow that which is ultimately more real than anything real we can name. And if it can, is there a possibility that despite that, let's say, temporal eclipse, there are some passages, there are some still corridors, there are some windows, there are some connective places where, let's say, the relationship between the essence and its expression as energy is in a state of constant flux and fluidity where it can be experienced at all times. Do you, do you hear what I'm trying to say? What I'm trying to say here is that is there a possibility, let's say we presuppose that indeed that temporal, that relative can obscure for a time being that which is the only real, call it whatever is your preference. And yet, is there a possibility that that is still accessible at all times? or experientially um, perceivable at all times. What would that be? Where would that be? Could it be somewhere on the palm of our hand? I don't know, maybe somewhere on our toes, on our foot? Maybe somewhere in the head, you know? Because, you know, it doesn't have to be 
in the center of our being, isn't it? It could be on the periphery of our body. Well, I'm not going to beat about the bush. There is something, there is this essence of our being which is directly perceivable at all times. It is right, right in the spiritual heart of our being. And it is positioned just slightly off the real physical heart. So it's on our, it's slightly towards the right side in the chest. Not like an object, not like a space. It's not even the cavity, although that could be com comparatively um, sort of explained as well, that there is this cave, there are many scriptures speak of that place, of the place of the cavity of the, of the cavity of the heart, where the spirit resides, the essence of our innermost being. And all of us have direct access to that. Not only that, we do not have access to that, but that what gives us access to anything else. This is the primordial center from where, where all the experiences come forth. And we experience it during those moments when the experience itself has not yet had time to register. It is that place where the experience itself cannot enter. And yet we have that, that, if we pay attention to that, we have direct sensation there and probably experience it, and I'm saying that in the inverted commas, we have direct sense of that, which is our essential nature, several times throughout the day. But to give you an example, for instance, right now here in Costa Rica, it's the rainy season, it's the season of thunder and lightning. There's a lot of storms, you know, almost every other day, the clouds gather, the pressure goes down, you know, up, it's brewing for a storm. And then all these clouds, all this electricity builds up and suddenly it releases itself. You know, flashes of lightning, which is, by the way, burnt our internet last Friday. But um, when that happens, you know, that lightning, you know, when, you, when it catches you unaware, you don't experience it through your retina, although it's a visual, visual impact. It experienced right in your heart. In the same way, after a few seconds, you know, you count like one, two, three, four, depends how far is that lightning took place, the thunder comes, that rocks everything. And sometimes it's so strong, it actually rocks the earth itself here. And when it rocks, that very instant, at that very instant, you feel, you feel that in your heart, in your spiritual heart. You feel consciousness as it is, and mixed with any coating, with any other experiences, in its purity. It is a very rare moment, a very rare moment of experience, and yet, and yet, it's available at all times. We all have that experience, you know, like when I had this interview with Rick uh, for the Buddha the Gaspan, towards the very end of that very long interview, the second one, Rick kept giving me this example of falling off the bike, you know, like as an example. He was trying to understand what I was trying to relate. And it is not the actual falling off the bike. It happens before. It happens before something might happen and you are in... You become aware of that before the mind can register, before the mind can process and before thought can take over and dress that experience into something logically uh, comprehensible. 
that very before is what I'm talking about. That before is the direct experience of our essential nature in its pure, raw state. I'll give you another example, which is very different, because all these examples, maybe someone will say, but all these examples are kind of terrifying. And indeed, this will explain you why, for instance, in Vedic or Indian tradition, there is this several, five phases of Shiva. Shiva stands for the Absolute. Shiva stands for pure consciousness. It stands for the pure state of being. And that has five faces. And one of them is Rudra. It is the aspect of Shiva, which literally means terrifying. Terrifying. That's the aspect of consciousness, which is terrifying from the perspective, obviously, of the human experience. However, however, that is the essence of our human experience, sorry, of the essence of our human being. And we'll go to that a little later so that we'll understand that the complexity of human being is formed of all these experiences which gives us, gives us that what we are and we take it for granted. But somehow we have preferences for certain experiences. Then those preferences being fostered, those pre preferences being lay laying sediment in our psyche and we go on through life being basically uh, prisoners of attachments and aversion. We have preferences and we have likes and dislikes and it is all based on this very relationship we have with the complexity of the experiences that with which life embedded us in the first place. So I was saying I was going to give you another example, very different from the terrifying one, although one, someone might say that's equally terrifying. But here we go. For instance, when you behold something exceptionally beautiful and I'm saying like it took my breath away it's not without a it's a very very close metaphor very close way of putting it it literally took my breath away it could be a work of art you know something it could be a landscape it could be something that something with you know it could be I don't know it could be a a flower or something that at that very moment gave, the, gave, the, gave us that direct, direct perception of something which we've recognized, recognized our essential nature. That, that, what takes our breath away and the experience of beauty, the aesthetical experience, for instance, in Kashmir Shaiva tradition, has a special place, you know, it has a special place, very special place. All human beings, because we are a reflection of that Supreme Consciousness, have the capacity to experience beauty at its most, most intense way. Because beauty is inseparable part of the Almighty. For instance, there is a surah in the Quran which says God is beautiful and he loves beauty. One can kind of dismiss it as just like, you know, a very um, a poetic way, you know, poetic expression, but it's not. It is for that very reason is that the capacity of a living being who is the embodiment of consciousness, of pure consciousness, have that experience of beauty which can take you, can take you and transport you from that very moment of wherever you are, whatever you're doing, into another space and time. Or it can take you beyond space and time straight to your essential nature.
This experience can also take place completely from something else. In fact, if you think about it, if you reflect on that, then, and if, you real, if we realize that all experiences actually come in the first place from our essence, from our spiritual heart, all the experiences actually are issued from here, and likewise being recognized when they you know, fall back, when we undergo the experience, because that's the full process. The cognitive process that we talk about, the gut and synaptical processes in the brain, it's only an anatomical reflection of that process. This is something that happens locally here, but we're taking a step further. This is where the science is at the moment. At the moment, neurophysiology making these breakthroughs in explaining our behavior, explaining our relationship with the world based on these very, very complexes of the way the endocrine system issues particular hormones which then activate certain impulses which fire up being perceived in the brain cortexes and that in itself creates a responsive reaction, creates an electrical uh, reaction which basically makes the endocrine system to produce those juices, you know, those hormones back into the body and the whole circle continues. Yet, we're looking at it not on the local scale, not on the local level of this physiology, we're taking it a logic, logical step further into the domain where that process actually linked to. And that process linked to nowhere but to the heart of our essential being, to the heart of our everything, you know, to the heart of, of life itself. That experience could happen, and again, when I'm saying experience, you always have to take it as, as a metaphor, as a like limitation of the language, because it's not an experience. That perception or direct, direct state of being, of which we talk about now, is not an experience. It happens before the experience can take place. The experience takes place after when that cognitive process, uh, process is have the chance to ignite. It's like in the same program I've mentioned before, the bad gap with Rick, I've mentioned the experience of the earthquake because when the earth shakes, before you have any sensation of awareness of your environment or, or what, before you recognize it, what happens, you feel that vibe straight in your heart, straight in the core of your being. When the child screams loudly, the mother perceives that here. She will recognize the voice of her child out of dozens if not hundreds of other screams because she carried that child close to her heart and she had that relationship, her own physical heart was beating with the heart of a child. So that symbiotic relationship is very, very, very strong. This is just to give you an example how there could be a multitude of ways in which we experience our being on a daily basis. The conformation of who we are beyond anything, when we strip down everything else that what we call, you know, because spiritual practices essentially is trying, trying to get back and reclaim to the lost sense of identity. It's the process of rewiring, that process of which we talk about just now, the cognitive processes need to be rewired. Without this rewiring, without this gut 
to brain cortexes uh, process being rewired, there is no true, true self-realization. This is why I am very um, level-minded about this current um, excitement that is sort of, you know, the, the current kind of um, euphoria, I would call it, even in uh, non-dualist circles, you know, because people think that you can just, through mental shift, somehow create the conditions whereby all these processes are being dismissed and one can abide in a state of recognition of one's own essential nature as that of Shiva, whatever, you know, if you're not from Indian tradition, absolute, you know, being, that, nothing, void, whatever is one's cultural, traditional preference. But it's not going to happen, like, you know, because your physiology will take over, because the, it's linked. The link is there at all times. You may temporarily have that very clear, very clear, palpable sensation, palpable inner recognition, and yet, and yet, the physiology is not separate, you know, you cannot just discard physiology, you cannot just say that, you know, like, it happened in my mind, the body will follow. Very often, the, the, you know, it's, the, the relationship is actually the other way around. Our mind has created this body in the first place, because this body is a reflection of our mind, but then, in the incarnated state of life, we follow our body. And when I say we follow our body, because we follow all the habits that are stored deep within. And the physical body, physical body, is inseparable from the pranic body, from the mind's body, from the body of the intellect. I'm talking about all these layers, all these sheets, all this layering with which, you know, our whole being is being dressed. So going back to what this whole, whole theme was about recognizing the essence of our being within throughout the most unexpected sort of events, you know, that we go through in our daily life. What's the value of that? What's the purpose of that? Okay, someone might say, right, I felt that, you know, and there was this gripping sensation for, you know, that arrested my heartbeat, you know, took my breath away. So what? You know, does that become my permanent experience? Does that become the permanent state of my being? No. It's being overshadowed again. And there's a lot of truth to that. Absolutely. Because you cannot exist in that state for too long. In fact, you know, the body will probably be perished if that state would be experienced or perceived long enough. Because the body has to be ready. The body has to be ready to contain, to embody that energy so that you can perceive yourself as yourself and yet, and yet, perceive as your, yourself as this omnipotent, omniscient reality and yet, without losing, losing the experience of your individuality. And that is the only true, true constitution of a true embodiment of that state. It is when the individuality and universality reflecting each other and real light, real light in such degree that there is no discrepancy whatsoever. It's just the way of appreciation. 
the way of appreciation. You appreciate your individuality and you perceive yourself and the others in the light of your individuality and yet your universality is never overshadowed. Likewise, your individuality is not being nihilated, it's not disappearing and it's not being vaporized because whilst up until we are in the body, that individuality has the right and reason to function. So that can only happen when that state is embodied. And the confirmation that that state has been fully embodied, when there is no discrepancies any longer, when there is no, there is no conflict any longer. Because the conflict between, between this body, let's say, this individuality and the recognized inner essence often being brought to the fore, often being brought to the apogee in the or throughout the certain stages of awakening and self-realization. So the value of knowing, knowing that there is direct way of being perceived here and now is, is so that that in itself, that in itself becomes almost like the place of the background of all experiences because when in deep states of meditation, on the altered states of consciousness, this is where the witness itself will fall back onto. This is where all experiences will be reconciled and submerged. So the, the value of, of that experience, the value of that experience, is always individually checked, is only always individually rediscovered and approved. Because that, that, you know, like takes us away from unnecessary wanderings, you know, like where do we go, you know, like for instance, people when they often undergo this energetic awakening, you know, when they have the, all these manifestations of energy, Shakti is rising, you know, so where does it rise, where does it go, so that, you know, like, do I jump out of my, uh, through my skull, do I kind of exit into the, some kind of uh, ether and start disappearing and merging with the spirit, you know, like, so that we go beyond all these speculations. We're not going anywhere, that's why, that's why the sages say, we're always at home. Why? Because we are always in a spiritual heart. Our home is here. So that in terms of spiritual anatomy, we don't wonder where, where do we go, in, in which stratosphere, in, we, in which loka, you know, in, which, in which heaven do we go. Ultimately speaking, we don't go into any heaven. Heaven is here. That's, that's the essence of heaven. And this is where I want you to take you. you know, this is where all your experiences come from and fall back to. And awareness of that has value of its own, which will be experienced by each of you in his or her own right.